uh, chair of the computational aerodynamics and uh, no section aerodynamics and chair in computational aerodynamics. Anyway, highly advanced science and also in international context. So Stefan is uh, secret uh, treasurer nowadays of the ERCOVTAC organization. But today, what is most important is the scientific expertise and which is the very advanced computational methods and modeling of flows, turbulence, plus many other things. <laughs> and today it's even very complicated because we have evaporation and uh, maybe combustion and so on. So what is the challenge to have a good model and have a result of the computation in a reasonable time? And Stefan will report on the recent developments in this area. So uh, it will be about uh, 35, 40 minutes. And then we please keep your questions to the end. You can always already put them in the chat. And uh, from a moment, so we are recording this uh, presentation. But we stop recording after the presentation before the question session, uh, questions sessions so uh, that's the agenda for today so i'm now uh, giving the floor to stefan yes thank you very much for the well, for the introduction for the invitation before and it's a, well, a great pleasure i try to share my screen and then you should see my title slide um yeah so i'm, I'm going to talk about Turbulence break combustion at, at very high pressures. And the, the important thing is that transcritical work, which means that we have uh, states which are partially supercritical and partially subcritical, so that we get um, yeah, supercritical fluids um, and also phase separation into subcritical liquid and, and vapor phases. And you see here, yeah, nice picture of one of our simulations. But yeah, before I start with the actual content, I would like to mention a few names. Um, so I'm, I'm going to present today work which has been done mostly by Mohamed and um, extending or working, building up on work done by, by Jan and also Hagen Müller before. So as, as PhD candidates, uh, and some of these PhD candidates are of course uh, quite advanced already. So uh, Hagen got a professorship actually quite recently, makes me very happy. And I'm also mentioning two senior collaborators, uh, Michael Witzner and Dirk Rupetz, um, who also are kind of very advanced in their career already. So there are many other people that I've been working with, and I'm, I, I don't want to put their slide with like 25 names. I just want to emphasize these five because they have taught me the most on, on this uh, topic. Good. Um, as an introduction, I want to show some pictures which are not from simulations, but from experiments. On the top, you see um, a mixing of uh, a liquid nitrogen, so at very cold temperatures, with gaseous nit nitrogen um, um, at, at a well, elevated pressure of uh, 28 atmospheres, which is below the critical pressure of nitrogen. You see basically um, a very nice sharp interface between the liquid and the gas. Um, it's the same fluid, but uh, yeah, in, with different temperatures, so therefore in liquid and gas state. And the um, attractive forces in the liquid basically uh, result in an interface uh, which tries to minimize its its area. Now, if we increase um, the pressure above the critical um, pressure of nitrogen, and that's the lower series of pictures, this is at uh, 69 atmospheres, so well above the critical pressure, then the picture changes a lot. So the gas behaves more and more like a liquid and the surface tension disappears and the mixing um, goes much faster. We are no more in a, in a turbulent and, and diffusive mixing regime, so we can mix at these high pressure things much more efficiently. And we can even mix things that otherwise wouldn't um, dissolve, uh, like, like uh, water and oil wouldn't really want to mix at, at lower pressures, but at supercritical pressures we can mix them. We also have uh, faster different, uh, fast chemistry and different reactions. Uh, we can use that for more efficient um, combustion engines and also for the reduction of emissions such as uh, soot or other unwanted species. Right now, the problem is that typically we don't want to mix just nitrogen with nitrogen, but we want to mix um, different, different species 
of fluids with different concentrations. And uh, it came quite surprising to me how sensitive this uh, supercritical regime is um, with regard to some kind of impurities. So for example, if you just add a tiny amount of helium to the gas phase, um, you get this picture, right? So now it's the same pressure as the, the middle picture, so well above the critical pressure of nitrogen and uh, usually above the critical pressure of helium. So critical pressure of helium is just two atmospheres and you actually have to go below like five Kelvin to make it liquid. Um, but the phase interface appears again. So we have a supercritical fluid mixing with another, uh, I mean, mixed with another supercritical fluid and we get a flow that looks like subcritical. And that's essentially what this, this talk is about. So why does this happen and how do we actually model these kind of phenomena? And yeah, to explain the why a bit, um, you see here um, a pressure temperature diagram with the two phase region highlighted um, for a mixture of, um, what was this, ethanol or something like this. Um, and you see that um, basically depending on the composition of that fluid, this two phase region can, have, uh, can become very, very large. Right, so the, the maximum pressure or the cucumber bar um, is for the mixture is much, much higher than the critical pressure of the pure fluid, which is, is here in this diagram. So phase separation occurs during the mixing because during the mixing we get all possible combinations, including those which want to exist in two separate phases. And if you look at, at hydrocarbon um, combustion, right, so then this um, maximum pressure of the two phase region is typically um, several hundred atmospheres, so much, much higher than the critical pressure of, of the pure fluid and oxidizer. Um, the test case that I'm going to um, use for this presentation a lot is the uh, ECN spray A. So that's a uh, um, yeah, test setup that, that models like a diesel combustion or kerosene combustion in, in, in gas turbines. Um, the, the fuel is uh, dodecane and it's injected in an atmosphere that contains um, oxygen, uh, nitrogen and some uh, CO2 and H2O. Um, the atmosphere is very hot uh, at 900 Kelvin for the case that I picked here, and the fuel is injected at uh, 363 Kelvin, and the pressure is 60 atmospheres. Um, the CO2 and H2O in the atmosphere results from a, um, basically from preheating um, the chamber by burning some acetone. And we are looking at two different cases. One case where no oxygen is left, so all the oxygen has been used to basically heat the chamber, and the second case. Um, um, it's a reacting case where oxygen is left and then we can actually burn the uh, injected fuel. Right, so these are the two cases. And um, here is a um, diagram where you basically see the two-phase region enclosed by this, these colored lines here. And you see the state of the pure fuel and the state of the um, atmosphere or the reservoir uh, plotted over the uh, temperature plotted over the um, nitrogen um, mole fraction. And you see uh, here in this, these, these dots, which are then partially colored, um, these are basically all the states that we observe in a simulation of, of that case. So we are passing right through this uh, two-phase region, and the temperatures that we are measured, they are really close to the equilibrium temperature that we can analytically calculate for this case. So this is these, these colored dots, basically the color indicates how much vapor we have um, in, in this two-phase region. This diagram also includes another set of, of dots which are from a different simulation where we did not account for the phase separation, so not for the multi-phase part, um, and used a, a different numerical scheme. And in this simulation, we are magically going around that two-phase region. So that's just to demonstrate that with um, different models, with different kind of fidelity, you can get quite different results. And just because a, a single phase model does not give you any state in the two phase region does not mean that the two phase region does not exist at these conditions. Right, um, so how can we simulate these kind of flows? Um, and I have here a list of like four different approaches that we could take. So one approach that, that, that we call the dense gas approach is um, basically what these uh, gray dots that go around the two phase region corresponds to. That's a dense gas approach. Um, we use a single phase uh, equation of state and ignore that the fluid would like to separate in two phases. This approach needs 
usually it also send some some clipping for undefined states in the two phase region where we would otherwise get like negative pressures or really strange values for some some transport properties. Um, but nevertheless, it gives often okayish results if you don't look too much into the details. Good, another approach that uh, adds basically information about the phase uh, interface or the phase separation is um, to, we can simulate this in a very detailed way by basically transporting um, a level set or a volume of fluid for the um, liquid part of the fuel and reconstruct the interface from, from these transported fields. Um, but this becomes extremely expensive because we need basically to resolve every small tiny droplet or bubble um, that occurs in, in, the, in the flow. So a better approach would be to use that interface tracking only for the really the, the liquid core near the injector and then transfer small droplets into Lagrangian particles that we transport with the fluid. Now this, this Lagrangian particle tracking can also be done in a, in a standalone way and this is what I think, at least from my experience, was, was more or less the industry standard. So we ignore the details of the actual the liquid core, but model everything as a, a statistically as a particle distribution. And these particles are very efficiently advected as as, as part, yeah, as Lagrangian particles in a on an earlier and background uh, flow. So that's very efficient computationally. And in order to get good results, we um, have to, however, calibrate these, these models. So we have to calibrate the particle distribution and we have to calibrate basically the action that is taken on these, these particles. Uh, particles. So then the results are, can be very good, but they're also very sensitive to this kind of calibration. Now, the fourth approach is what we call uh, real fluid multiphase uh, thermodynamics or MT for short. Um, this is based on solving just fundamental conservation laws and reconstruct phase composition using local equilibrium assumptions. So this method is then based only on, on first principles of Newtonian mechanics and Gibson thermodynamics and does not contain any other free uh, calibration parameters that we would have to select case by case. It only requires like accurate fluid properties or species properties um, from, from databases, but nothing that depends on, on the flow case that you like to simulate. So in my opinion, uh, this method, this uh, real fluid multiphase thermodynamics method is the, gives the highest possible level of detail and accuracy at a reasonable cost, uh, like in an LES of these kind of flows. That's kind of already in con conclusions, but I hope to convince you during the talk um, that makes sense to use that method. And so I would like to explain it in this presentation. So the basic idea is um, that we basically derive a, a coarse grained or a, a finite scale model by averaging fluid elements over a finite volume in such a way that some fine scale information is, is, is removed. So if you consider like some fluid element, which doesn't have to be square, but just some, some part of the fluid, which consists of a liquid and the vapor phase, uh, we average um, all state, all quantities you know, over this, this fluid element, basically by you know, just integrating any quantity over the volume, dividing by the volume, then we get some kind of mixture state. And this mixture evolves then according to the stresses or the actions that work on the interface of that surface element of this uh, fluid element. Right, so we need to calculate then somehow stresses or fluxes over, over the surface of, of that um, fluid element. Now, in order to get these uh, stresses, fluxes, or other actions, um, we actually need to reconstruct some fine scale information because um, we need to know how much vapor, how much liquid actually there is. So the, the least thing we need to know is what is, for example, the vapor mole fraction. And from this, we can then basically get the total energy as the composition, as the average or the um, sum of the liquid and the um, energy in the liquid and the energy in the, in the vapor and of course the same for any other quantity. So if you apply this in a, a virion frame um, on, a, on a fixed mesh, then that is very consistent with a classical finite volume discretization of, of the transport equations. So it just means that we have to discretize the Navier-Stokes equations on a, on a given mesh in a conservative finite volume uh, method and then account for phase separation and the thermodynamics in, in these equations in, in certain parts. And this is what I show here. So these are the compressible Navier-Stokes equations um, for a fluid with um, whatever n number of components. So we transport 
for us, we also we transport the, the total density, but we also transport the partial densities or the, the mass fractions of, of the species. We have a um, linear momentum um, conservation law and we have a total energy conservation law. Right, and all these um, terms which are enclosed in these orange boxes, these are things that we have to modify or where we have to account for multiphase thermodynamics. So these are the orange boxes. So first we need some kind of uh, volumetric um, equation of state to get, for example, the pressure or the temperature that we might need for the um, the, the other terms here. Um, and we um, do that by to do, um, derive these equations of state uh, by performing so-called vapor liquid equilibrium calculations. Um, so basically reconstructing how much vapor and how much liquid exists um, in, in a particular cell in, in this final volume mesh. Um, yes, we need a caloric equation of state as well. Uh, we need transport models um, and, and um, transport properties of the mixture. So that's basically for the diffusion and the viscous um, forces here. And we need chemical reaction rates that also account for high pressure effects and, and phase separation possibly. Now, um, the choice of equation of state, this is uh, also a matter of taste sometimes. Um, I show here some some results for the volumetric equation of state um, and for for a CP for a color uh, quantity, um, and you see there are three colored lines, which are three cubic equations of states: so, uh, Peng Robinson, uh, Suave, Ridley Kwong, and RK. Um, Ridley Kwong, Peng Robinson, a relatively recent development, and they all can be expressed in this general form of a cubic equation of state, where um, this B here essentially accounts for the volume of um, and the size of, of our molecules and we have attractive forces and we have some um, basically model parameters or functionals uh, delta one and delta two which are um, well simple numbers maybe for some equations of state and for the RKPR um, they are a function also of the critical um, um, state so with that we see here that the RKPR is for us the, the most accurate equation of state um, and that's what we are going to use I know that some people also uh, consider um, um, the PCSAFT equation of state for, for these kind of flows, and this is a, actually a very good choice for hydrocarbons. You see, for example, here that's that's the gray line, so for very low temperatures it gives a much more, well, slightly more accurate prediction of the density. Um, but PCSAFT has other disadvantages, like for example, CP does not look so, so great here, and it does not work as well for other species which are not um, hydrocarbon changes. Good, um, yes, so the RKPR is the equation of state that we are going to use. And we are use, going to use that in a multi-phase thermodynamics uh, framework. So we are accounting for uh, the equilibrium state, uh, the equilibrium, equilibrium phase decomposition between vapor and, and liquid. And we do that in order to avoid these unphysical states that would occur if we apply the same equation of state in a dense gas approach, right? So this, this dashed blue line is the pressure we would get for different um, specific volumes um, in a dense gas approach, so ignoring phase separation, and you see that we can actually get here negative pressures. And typically you would expect if you compress the fluid that then the pressure should get higher, but here with a dense gas approach, the pressure gets lower if I compress my fluid. So that's something we don't want to have in this framework. Um, we assume basically that the time scales for phase separation are relatively quick compared to the time step of our simulations because we have a coarse LES mesh. And then we would like to have um, these um, pressure uh, volume um, dependence um, shown here as this orange line without any spurious states that would need special treatment. Good. Um, yeah, now the question is how do we get to this, this orange line, and this requires that we do this vapor liquid equilibrium calculations. And this has been done a lot um, for, for many, many years. Uh, so classical methods uh, have been proposed by, by Michelson and, and colleagues. Um, so these methods are typically built around a so-called PT flash. So we assume a pressure and a temperature, and then we calculate the phase splitting for these pressure and temperatures. Now, the problem is that in our conservative Navier-Stokes solver, the input is not pressure and temperatures, but um, well, the overall composition, the molar volume or the density of the fluid and the internal energy of the fluid. So we have to iterate 
um, than pressure and temperature in order to satisfy the uh, get the same total um, density and total energy as as our flow solver predicts. So this makes this method quite expensive um, because we have basically this inner iterations in the PT flash and we have outer iterations of um, pressure and temperature to satisfy the input of um, the, the flow solver. Um, another thing um, is that the computational cost of these methods scales um, at least quadratically with the number of species, which makes it also extremely expensive for um, combustion simulations where we have a large number of species. So when we started doing this in about 2015, uh, people considered it really impossible to do it in, in LES. We uh, used it first just as a post-processing or other people used it in steady state runs. But for LES where we have like millions of cells and we have to do these calculations uh, for millions of cells in the millions of, of time steps, uh, it was just considered infeasible and took us quite a lot of effort to make it um, fast enough to, to um, apply in, in this method. And that's published in, um, in a paper with Jan Matthijs and, and myself. Um, but yeah, but still for reacting simulations, the cost was still um, uh, scaling very unfavorably. And that's why um, we went back to the basics and um, reformulated everything in a different framework. Uh, this is work done by Mohamed, so he reformulated the phase equilibrium conditions uh, in terms of a molar specific value of the of a volume function. Um, so instead of a fugacity um, in, in, in terms of a yeah, specific volume function and um, also replaced the PT flash, the inner PT flash iteration by a so-called VT flash. So um, directly taking the um, density or the volume that comes from the flow solver as an as a input so that we don't have to iterate in P, but only need to iterate in, in T to obtain this uh, isoenergetic, isochoric flash that we actually need. Uh, the other nice thing is when we um, just iterate basically the um, temperature to get the right internal energy, then the Jacobian is also um, uh, quite well known, uh, right? So this is just a classical CV and we know how to compute it and we anyway would like to compute it. And what we observed then in the end is that this method uh, yields very, very nice, very robust conversions of the newton refson methods with these um, exact Jacobian. While for the previous method that we used with Matthijs, we had a lot of issues um, with, with robustness and need to some special treatments and fallback options and so on. Good, what you see here is uh, some proof of, um, of robustness and convergence. So this is um, M10 oil mixture, so that's um, 10 species from C1 to C14. And um, you see here basically this, this two-phase region uh, of a pressure and temperature. And we pick here just like three points. The D uh, is more um, on the uh, low temperature side. So E is close to the critical point and F is close to the uh, bubble point curve here. And you see um, for, for these three points, you see here like the um, three lines uh, for a PT flash, for a VT flash, for HP flash, and for the UV flash that we use in our solver mostly. And you see that we uh, converge really, really nicely in like four to whatever, seven, eight iterations to an accuracy, which is perfectly fine for CFD. And also in a very robust way. That, that's what I should say. Um, for multi component, um, Mixture, so for mixtures with a very large number of components, um, still this classical methods would lead, this, this method would lead um, to a quadratic scaling of the computational time over the number of components, both for PT or UV flash or for any other flash calculation. Um, in order to solve this issue, to be able to really go to a large number of um, components, um, we um, basically implemented a reduction method which reduces the uh, computational cost or the size of the system to um, a much smaller size that is roughly independent of the number or the, so that the cost is roughly independent of the number of species. And yeah, so this is here sh shown again for, for a mixture of uh, N-heptane and uh, ethane. So basically the computing time here is for 100 times 100 uh, flash calculations in, in this, this box highlighted in this, this phase diagram. You see basically that we can do flash calculations with like a mixture of 30 components um, where we basically added pseudo components. You can do it almost in the same time as, as a binary species um, flash calculation. 
Good. This basically covers the equation of state. We have to talk a bit about transport properties. So we use um, in because we are lacking basically a good model for um, 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 the volume viscosity. We, we just use Stokes um, hypothesis for the viscous term and viscosity and conductivity. We calculate using a chunks method with an appropriate mixing rule for um, two um, for the two phase region. Heat, flux, heat fluxes um, include, of course, the, the enthalpy diffusion, which is, is very important under these conditions, and partial enthalpies we estimate um, with this kind of simplified equation, just to save a bit of computational cost. Um, for the LES that I'm showing here, mass fractions are the driving force for diffusions, um, but we can also use other driving forces. And the effective um, binary diffusion coefficients between the species and the bulk mixture is, is, is calculated like this for the full uh, coefficient matrix. So these diffusion coefficients, they uh, are approximated with uh, Chapman-Lanscorp theory, and um, you also have high pressure corrections available, but these are not needed if the system pressure is below 100 atmospheres, and then this is what we are going to use um, for the simulations that I'm showing later here. So chemistry, um, for chemistry, um, we typically use like Arrhenius laws where we need concentrations um, as um, as an input, but for high pressure conditions, we should not basically use um, um, just the mole fractions, but we use fugacity. Um, uh, right, um, but in, because we have formulated our thermodynamics framework in terms of the specific volume function, we also replace fugacity here by the um, specific volume function, and that gives a very nice, um, very short equation for the concentrations. Uh, backward reaction rates can be then calculated using the equilibrium constant in a, in a classical way. Good, the reaction model that we are using for the simulations that I'm showing here for the spray A, this is a quite um, special, um, yeah, strongly reduced mechanism. It's, it's a two-step or two-reaction mechanism from Hakim, um, which is highly optimized for these particular conditions um, that we are looking at. So the reaction rates, um, you you uh, see them here. Um, so the the, the second um, reaction actually um, has, has two um, exponentials, and the pre-exponential factor of the first reaction rate is a complex ex expression that involves some calibration parameters, and also the equivalence ratio um, of the unburned mixture. Now this is this is a thing that is not directly available, but we have to think how to approximate this in a solution in a, in a simulation, um, where um, the the unburned mixture is basically um, yeah this is different uh, in in different spatial locations, but we assume that essentially the mixing takes place before the uh, reactions, and then we can estimate this by tracking the uh, fraction of of um, nitrogen. Right, and here in the, in the figure, you just see a demonstration that this model can predict the emission delay time in a um, perfectly stirred reactor very accurately, um, with the same accuracy approximately as other methods. Good, the flow solver that we are using um, is obviously it's a finite volume um, method. Uh, we use it in an implicit LES uh, framework. Um, so hyperbolic terms and subgrid scale model are provided by the so-called adaptive local de deconvolution method. Um, that's a nonlinear finite volume discretization um, um, that basically works on a numerical flux function and is um, tuned in such a way that it's consistent with uh, turbulent theory in both the compressible and incompressible regime. Um, in order to avoid like spurious undershoots or overshoots in the mass fractions and internal energy, we use some um, upland bias or some, some limiters um, there and viscous fluxes are discretized with a second order central scheme. So time integration is done with a third order uh, Runge-Kutta scheme, and the meshes that we are using are Cartesian, block Cartesian with uh, adaptive local refinement. And here's an, here's an example mesh, or the mesh that, that we have been using here. So it's a Cartesian block structured mesh uh, with se seven different levels of refinement. Um, about 40% of uh, the cells are on the finest level, which is really near the injector. And um, the the cells like further away are like 128 times coarser, and um, 
yeah, don't contribute so much to the number of cells. So we really finally very fine resolve the region of where, where most things happen and rapidly get coarser in the in the outer part. And you might see you could see if you look carefully some of these coarsening steps also in, in the results, but not dramatically. Good for the setup. Um, we use um, transient inflow conditions uh, without any superimposed fluctuations because the injection velocity is so high that any instabilities at the interface will more almost instantaneously trigger transition to turbulence. Also because we got a lot of get a lot of um, acoustics from from downstream. So it's just um, yeah essentially assumed to be laminar inflow but rapidly transitioning to turbulence. And we consider two uh, chamber conditions. Uh, both have a temperature of uh, 900 Kelvin and 60 bars, but the difference is between um, an inert case without any oxygen left and the reacting case where 15% of oxygen are there. Now, some, some results. Um, so nice thing of, of this method is that we can really look at how our um, species distributed in the um, liquid part and in, in the lake, uh, in the vapor part, especially in the two phase region. Um, and yeah, you see here some visualizations um, where in, in color you always see the mole fraction um, in the part where we have both phases um, um, existing. So the first two panels show basically the dodecane, so the fuel in the vapor phase and the fuel in the liquid phase. And it's quite obvious that. Uh, as expected, the fuel is mostly in the liquid phase because that's how we inject it. Um, you see also here then carbon dioxide and uh, nitrogen, um, which are present uh, in, in the atmosphere. And you see that these are mostly um, existing in the gas phase, right? So almost all the carbon dioxide is here and almost nothing is really in the um, in the uh, core of the liquid jet, uh, same for, for nitrogen. So this is also as expected. And I think the most interesting thing is when we look at, at the water um, splitting between liquid and vapor, um, you see that both, both pictures look very similar. So we have very similar concentrations of uh, water in the liquid and in the vapor phases. And this can of course be explained by um, that the liquid and the, the fuel is injected at relatively cold temperatures. So the water um, condensates uh, there and then rapidly diffuses into the liquid core or into the liquid uh, droplets as well. So that's a quite interesting observations of for the non-reacting case. And now I show you here some visualizations of the reacting case. So yeah, th so this um, movie shows quite a lot. Um, I will play it several times. Um, you see um, in, in green, you see the, the vapor volume fraction in, in the two phase region. So in, in a more, more lighter green, um, the more liquid we have. In orange, you see isosurfaces of um, isosurfaces of, of uh, a low at a low temperature of about 900 Kelvin. That shows basically where low temperature reactions uh, start or, or take place. And in red, um, isosurfaces at 2000 Kelvin. So this is where high temperature reactions, um, the actual combustion really takes place. So now I would like to stop that movie at some point. Um, right, you see here in the bottom corner, you see also the time. So I can show you that really at pretty exactly four, uh, 400 microseconds, the uh, high temperature reaction start in some ignition kernels uh, further downstream in the, in the gas phase, and then things rapidly um, spread throughout the um, throughout the jet. And then at some point, the flame front stabilizes uh, at a relatively sharp position uh, near the injector. And we'll look at this um, flame lift of length later in a, in, a, in a graph. Now here's some, some scatter plots that um, also show where um, Ignition takes place. So this scatter plots show all states in, in the simulation. So it plotted temperature over mixture fraction. And we see that this cold temperature reactions start roughly at the stoichiometric mixture, which is this um, vertical line. And vertical line here. And then uh, the reactions rapidly spread towards the richer and more lean uh, parts of the fluid. And as I said, yeah, the ignition delay time is in very good agreement 
with experimental data. Now, in order to see how good things are, um, we can compare with a lot of experimental results, for example, with um, um, shadow graphy uh, visualizations. You see here um, on the left, the non-reacting case, uh, the experimental re uh, visualizations and some roughly equivalent numerical visualizations. Uh, and on the right, you see the same thing for the reacting case. Um, of course, the experimental pictures are relatively coarse grained because it's really challenging to take like a million frames per second at, at high resolution. So you have to compromise temporal and spatial resolution. Um, but you can see that the, both the jet shape and also the, the penetration and uh, everything, the structures we see, it's, it looks extremely similar between both experiments and simulations. And also for the reacting case, you see that the spreading where the flame front basically is at a certain time also takes place. Um, yeah, this is, uh, takes place at the same spatial locations. Now for more quantitative, quantitative um, visualizations, we can look, for example, at the liquid penetration length and the vapor penetration length for both experiments and simulations. So here the simulations are the, the colored lines. So in blue is the liquid penetration length for the inert case in the top figure. Um, and in, in black is the, are the experimental results and they're pretty exactly on these um, experimental values and the green line is the vapor penetration length so basically the the front of of the of the jet and we are also very close to i mean exactly on top of the experimental values until a certain time and then when the um, the jet progresses further also in course regions we see some deviations but there's also a lot of spread between different realizations in the experiment so i wouldn't really say that this is an error it's just a small difference for the reacting case, we see um, essentially the same. I mean, it looks like even the agreement with the vapor penetration uh, length is better um, than for the inert case. Uh, but again, this can be just uh, variations between cases. Liquid penetration length remains uh, exactly on the experimental results. And also the flame lift of length, which is this red line, is um, very accurately um, giving, um, well, predicting the experimental results here. So we are extremely happy with these results. Um, and now maybe an open question is whether this model, this, this, or this, this complexity of the model is really needed in order to get these uh, kind of good results. And so we compared also with other data from literature and well, found nothing that comes close to, to this kind of accuracy. In, in particular, flame lift of length is always predicted, always uh, very often predicted quite, quite wrong. And uh, getting both vapor and liquid penetration length right is is challenging. So I will show you some um, some example results or ex uh, comparison with experimental results with no, with other simulation results on the next slide. And I'm focusing here in the first 0 0.2 milliseconds where we have uh, actually for this case where we have the largest differences between the experimental values and our results. Um, you see it here uh, again. This this black or gray shaded is, is the experimental reference, and here in green is is our results, which give here uh, after a very short time a, a small overshoot for the liquid penetration length, but then settles on the right level. And in um, in in purple, you see results from a, a Lagrangian particle tracking method from a very reliable source um, where they have done careful calibration and I think they got very good results. But when we then look at the vapor penetration lengths, we see that they actually underestimated quite drastically also already after such a very short time uh, because it's difficult to calibrate this method for both um, vapor and liquid um, simultaneously. Now the blue line is a classical dense gas approach, uh, so ignoring phase uh, separation, and we take this from a reference of Hakim. So this is where we took also our reaction mechanism from, and you see that they basically have a 50% error in the liquid penetration length, and also quite significant errors in the vapor penetration. Um, one thing, this dense gas approach, of course, it does not give you directly an indication where is liquid and where is vapor. You have to choose like thresholds based on density. And, and still um, they couldn't match um, the experimental results more accurately than this. So the question is why uh, does this multiphase thermodynamics work so well? Um, especially with this extremely, um, well, simple reaction mechanism. 
And I would say the, the answer is, um, yeah, that that the, this VLE calculations that we perform um, also together with the uh, quite accurate uh, equation of state is RKPR. Um, gives very accurate input for the for the reaction mechanism. And in particular, the VLE solver gives us a reconstructs part of this subgrid scale resolution. So it's kind of a subgrid scale model for thermodynamics. And the other thing is um, that this LESMT method is accurate in my opinion just because it's calibration free. So there are no parameters that we can choose wrongly. All the parameters that we use are reliable uh, species properties and um, things from, from reliable sources um, that we can trust and therefore cannot do much wrong when we just apply it. Um, good, yeah, the reaction mechanism, as I said, it's very simple, but it's highly optimized for this particular case. And it has enough like degrees of freedom to capture both uh, time scales of, of cold and hot, hot ignition quite accurately. One point that is, of course, also important is that we have um, a rock solid LES discretization and turbulence models that can predict mixing very accurately and therefore also giving very accurate input to the reaction mechanism. And this allows us to use um, these very coarse measures um, that I've shown here with, in this case, was just nine cells over the injector diameter. So that's extremely coarse and still gives um, very accurate results here. But yeah, what I should also mention is that this LES, uh, these LES results that I have, have shown, they don't explicitly account for interactions between uh, subgrid scale turbulence and chemistry, right? So we just um, applied the chemistry, uh, the, the finite rate chemistry directly to the input from the solver. And there's also no models for, for variation, subgrid scale variations of pressure, temperature and composition, because we could expect that in with these strongly nonlinear equations of state that there is also some subgrid scale terms that we should account for. This is something that we are currently doing in, in our well, current and also future work. And um, we, we, are, yeah, we are looking forward to this. So there's, there are many things that we can still improve. Um, but for now, I want to just um, highlight this, this paper where you find most of the results that I have presented here. Good, now I would have a few more slides. I can maybe just very quickly go through them because I think I have maybe five more minutes or so. Is that correct? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I said um, subgrid scale effects, some subgrid scale effects have not been accounted for, and of course it's very difficult in, in these still relatively expensive simulations to look at small effects and quantify them, and therefore we uh, we have done a lot of work recently on um, simple 1D um, um, yeah, counterflow diffusion flamelets, uh, including multi-phase, um, real fluid multi-phase uh, thermodynamics there. So you certainly know this kind of setup where we have uh, oxidizer, a fuel, and which um, just meet each other roughly at the center, and then we have a flame somewhere near that. Uh, we solved this set of equations. Um, we have validated the solver, of course, with some reference data from from literature for, in this case here, uh, what I can show is for hydrogen and oxygen mixing at pressures between 25 and 250 atmospheres. And so we can can say with all the uncertainties in, in like or differences in model choices, we have an extremely good agreement with, with um, reliable reference data here as well. So we can trust the solver and can use that for more fundamental studies. Um, so one thing um, that we can that I also mentioned that is important is what kind of mixing law we take for, for transport properties like um, conductivity and viscosity. Uh, because in our solver, we don't have um, fine scale information available. We can only calculate or yeah, reconstruct kind of statistics of the fine scale information. Um, and depending on what you then additionally assume, you can, can get different viscosities or conductivities in this two phase region and we choose this um, so-called uh, effective medium theory model, which is basically assuming that things are randomly distributed. And then we get um, these kind of curves, which are shown here in, in blue for the thermal conductivity and viscosity. And if we don't do that, we would get curves like this, um, which show um, again some, some strange behavior, which we consider physically not correct. Um, 
where we can see that things are physically not correct is when we look at molecular diffusion. Um, because if you take a, yeah, realistic good driving, uh, realistic driving forces for um, high pressures and just apply a dense gas model without phase separation directly, then we can get um, non-physical anti-diffusion, which effectively basically separates the fuel and the oxidizer instead of uh, helping to mixing them. So this is also successfully avoided with this multi-phase thermodynamics with appropriate mixing rules, where we get um, nice um, distribution of the diffusion mass flow and, and the nice mixing and fueling of, of the flame. When we look at um, what's the effect of, again, the uh, thermodynamics or the equation of state on um, uh, transport properties like um, um, and also, also the state like density and, and, and CP. Um, we see, of course, that ideal gas models would give quite wrong results for the density and therefore also for um, CP and, and for the um, heat conduction uh, coefficients. And uh, the dense gas model ignoring phase separation gives also kind of strange curves when directly applied there and also a very large overshoot in, in CP that is um, well discussed a lot in literature, but in this two-phase region, it's actually not considered physical. So this is all solved with the multi-phase thermodynamics models. Now, um, one important thing when we have reacting flows is, of course, when does the reaction start? So what's the ignition delay time? And we see that there the conclusions are kind of more diverse or more interesting. We see uh, again in, in green here is, is our multi-phase thermodynamics model giving um, that we have seen that gives um, quite good agreement also for the flame lift of lengths and so on. So we assume that uh, this is an accurate prediction also for the ignition delay time. If you use an ideal gas in this counterflow diffusion flame lift for the same conditions again as, as the spray A before, um, ignition starts too early and if we apply a dense gas method Ignoring phase separation, then ignition takes place far too late. So that would correspond to a flame lift of length, which is far um, too large, probably. Um, so this is for the trend and how, how the, the uh, ignition starts. Um, but when we look at the steady state, then surprisingly, the differences are quite little. And you can imagine that at um, steady state, the temperatures are very hot. Uh, so we are more in a, in a gas, uh, we are certainly in a, in a gas phase, we are more ideal than the mixing before. And in the steady state, um, yeah, the, the differences in the CO, uh, CO2, uh, H2O, CO concentrations um, is basically almost not there. Uh, but we see kind, kind of significant differences in formaldehyde and uh, hydroxyl um, in, in the flame. But this is outside also, it's, it's all in the gas phase outside of the VLE region in the steady state. Um, when we look at the diffusion driving force, um, then well, one important thing that you should not do is not assume like a constant Lewis number, definitely not use Lewis number of one, but also no other constant value because it gives quite uh, wrong predictions for the ignition delay time, but also quite wrong um, final um, or maximum temperatures. Um, uh, regarding the use of an ideal driving force, so just based on, on a mole fraction or mass fractions, or a driving force that count, accounts for high pressure effects, so also like Fugasti based or something like this. Uh, there, the differences are, um, they exist, but they are rather small, say. Um, and again, when we look at the steady state results, then we see clearly that um, as long as we have multi component, uh, uh, a multi multi phase um, multi component uh, thermodynamics, um, then things agree very well. And um, unitary Lewis number gives again completely wrong results. Very very different flame structure in effect. Good. Uh, last but not least, uh, effect of real gas chemistry. So how do we calculate the concentrations? Cal do we calculate them directly from mole fractions or from um, uh, fugacity or um, volume fraction? Um, so in red would be the ideal gas approximation and in uh, blue the real chemistry approximation um, or model. And there again we see a noticeable but relatively small effect in the ignition delay time and also the um, well, flame evolution. So that's actually, I didn't say that 
that's mixed refraction and and time and you see uh, basically formulated in hydraulic serial uh, again to show the early ignition and the uh, established flame and then the delay look both pretty pretty similar but we see that when we go to um well, when we when we apply this at low pressures like 20 bars then we see that it makes almost no difference but the higher the pressure is so at 60 bar the difference is already it's noticeable but maybe not uh, dramatic but at even higher pressures of like uh, whatever 100 200 300 atmospheres um, these differences would become very large good and with that i would like to show my my final conclusion slide um so conclusions on equation of state modeling is that um, including phase separation is crucial for accurate predictions of, of these kind of flows because if you don't include phase separation no yearly calculation in a dense gas approach we get spurious artifacts and uh, wrong transport properties in the uh, in the two-phase region these things these spurious things don't uh, occur in an ideal gas method, method but the ideal gas um, model is um, very inaccurate and, and cannot be used at all and these artifacts are also successfully removed with the multi-phase thermodynamics if we combine a cubic equation of state or any other equation of state which is accurate enough and with VLE calculations. Um, if we regularize single-phase dense gas uh, methods to remove these spurious artifacts, that typically leads to either a spurious temperature increase if we remain mass conserving or to a spurious conservation errors in the mass if we, if we try to keep energy conserving. So that's, in my opinion, not, not really a method that you should do. And again, I would like to emphasize that this multi-phase thermodynamics method is accurate because it's consistent with uh, fundamental principles and it's calibration free. So regarding transport and chemistry model, um, using suitable mixing rules in the two-phase region is crucial, crucial for, for accurate uh, transport properties. Um, if you use um, um, Lewis, uh, constant Lewis number assumption for, for diffusion, that's uh, very wrong. It shouldn't be done. Um, if you use accurate driving forces, um, well, then, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, certain, certainly better, but um, the differences between uh, multi-phase thermodynamics with a, a real gas driving force and ideal driving force are maybe less dramatic than than um, using yeah just a constant Lewis number assumption. Steady state solutions are often rather similar for different uh, multi-phase thermodynamics transport models, um, but the ignition delay time and the transient and the intermediate species, which relate also to unwanted emissions, that's highly sensitive on these transport models and the uh, real gas chemistry. Good, that's all I have prepared for today. Thank you, and I'm ready to take some questions. Thanks, Stefan.